I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth Israel shall not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall not slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Join us as we give that God our best praise. As I look back over my life, I can see how your love has guided me.
Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is Pastor Williams, and as always, I greet you with Jesus' joy. Well, it's time for the word, and so get yourself situated. Get yourself together, because I believe there's a word for you. If you're by yourself, you're not by yourself. The Lord is with you. If you're with family and friends and y'all are watching this together, I hope and pray that it is a blessing to you and perhaps the topic of conversation after is over. God bless you. i see you after the worship experience. Join hands with those around you. Let's go to God in prayer. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for being God and being good. We are not confused. We understand that we are where we are because you have been so gracious and kind. It's not our money, not our job, not our spouses or families, not our degrees, prestige, or positions. It's you, Lord. And whatever we go through, it's, it may not be good, but you're working it out for our good. Now, God, as we prepare for the preaching moment, we confess today that we can do nothing until you come. Bless your people. Make fallow the ground of the souls of your people. That the seed of truth might find depth. That a relationship might be established between some soul and the Savior. Then Lord, help me, your preacher. Breathe on my words and make them thine. Rescue me from me. Fill me and empty me at your will. Love me and do whatever you want with me. Hide me behind Calvary's cross. Make my preaching so thin in human wisdom that only the shadow of the cross can be seen beneath. Take your glory, but Master, please give us the blessings, we pray. We ask it all in the name of the pre-existent, incarnate, crucified, resurrected, ascended, and soon coming King's name, we pray. All the people of God said together, amen. amen. Give our good God some praise. Amen. Everybody say expanding our territory. Amen. That's the theme for 2016 and beyond. And the under theme is commitment. That's what we've been talking about. And we are committed to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, among other things. So if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8. I want to lift up some passages of scripture about one who shared his faith. And as a consequence, one left in joy. Acts chapter 8, verse 4 through 8, and verses 26 through 39. Acts 8, 4 through 8, 26 through 39. Turn in your Bible, tap in your app. Let's see what the Spirit has to say to the church. Amen. While you're looking for it, let me just say again that I'm glad to see you this morning. I'm glad that I pastor a people who love God so much that regardless of the weather, they come to give God some praise. Amen. I figure if he could go to the cross for me, I can come to church in the cold for him and give him praise. Amen. Acts 8, if you found it, say amen. Beginning with verse 4 in the New International Version of the Greek text, it reads like this. Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowd heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Verse 26, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert, Somebody said desert. Desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian, a eunuch, an important official in charge of all of the treasury of the Kandake or Candace, King James says, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. 
The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. The Spirit, then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless somebody explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his, his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Or what hinders me? Is there anything that keeps me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord with the help of the Holy Spirit in your prayers. I want to preach from the simple subject, an Ethiopian meets Jesus. An Ethiopian meets Jesus. Ushers, please let them come in quickly, quietly, and reverently so we can see what the Spirit has to say to the church as we wrestle with that theme. An Ethiopian meets Jesus. Come right on in. Come on in quickly. And we don't want you to miss this word this morning. It's good to see you here. Amen. Amen. If you can't find some seats, there's one, some right up here in the front or near the front. Amen. Everybody repeat after me. An Ethiopian meets Jesus. Amen. Give God praise for that. Amen. Amen. I still have some people who are looking for some seats. Here's some seats right up here. Tell them they can come up here. And uh, there's some seats right behind where I was sitting if you need some. Amen. They still coming. Praise the Lord. Amen. Here's a seat right here. Amen. <laughs> That's my homeboy. We went to we went to uh, junior high school together. We actually did. We went to in Florida. We went to junior high school together, played ball together. Amen. And uh, if you had known us back then, you'd never know that both of us would be preaching now. God knows. <laughs> Amen. Everybody say an Ethiopian meets Jesus. Amen. At the time of this text, the Church of Jesus Christ has received its marching orders from Jesus to make disciples of all nations. Not only have they received their marching orders, but they've also received power to carry out the orders. For the Bible says they have been imbued or empowered by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Now that they've given their commission, been given their commission and empowered to do the work because you can't do God's work without God's help. The Bible says that they began to do the work and fan out throughout Jerusalem. And as they shared the faith, the Bible says that people were being added to the number every day. But they did not do what they did without opposition. The Bible says it wasn't long before there was persecution. The persecution was initially aimed at the leadership. That is, they singled out the apostles to persecute, and they were often drugged to court or incarcerated because of the preaching of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I suppose that the enemies attacked the apostles because they reasoned in their mind, if we can just cut the head off, the body would follow, not knowing that the apostles were not the head of the church that Jesus is. 
And it was useless to kill Jesus because they tried to do it on a Friday. <laughs> but he just got back up on Sunday morning. So they tried to, and the Bible says that that didn't work. They intensified or stepped up their efforts to persecute by targeting some others, not apostles, but more specifically, they targeted a deacon named Stephen. He was one of the six chosen to carry grocery sacks to widows, that is to minister to the physical needs of the widows. But he was also one who preached God's word. And when they got wind of what Deacon Stephen was preaching, he ended up being stoned to death. Interestingly enough, while he was being stoned, there was one present named Saul who later became Paul, who was there holding the cloak of those who held the stones who killed Deacon Stephen. Stephen was so full of the spirit that while he was on trial, the Bible says, though falsely accused, his face shone like an angel. And so full of Jesus was this deacon that when he died, he died like Jesus. What I mean is not that he was crucified, but the Bible says while he was being stoned, like Jesus, he looked up and prayed for the people who were killing him. The Bible says that when he went down, another deacon stood up. It's the deacon in our text. His name is Philip. He too was one of the seven chosen in Acts 6 to carry grocery sacks to widows, and he did it faithfully. And when you're faithful over a few things, God will make you ruler over many. And the Bible says that even though he was assigned to take care of the widows, he was not confined to his assignment. And he also preached the gospel because he had a burning zeal and a passionate desire to tell Peter about the love of Christ. He was not ordained, was not clergy, because you don't have to be either in order to tell people about Jesus. In fact, the Bible says that when persecution was stepped up, even in the teeth of the wind, that the people who were running were running to preserve their lives, but while they were trying to preserve their lives, they were telling other people about one who could give them life. While they were running, they were preaching. And the Bible says that while they were scattered like seed to the wind, that this deacon named Philip went to a city in Samaria. He went there honoring God by preaching about his love through Jesus Christ. And because he honored God, God honored him. He honored God's gospel and God honored his efforts by giving him heavy anointing. And the Bible says that not only did he preach so that people would be delivered from their sins, but he also ministered so that they were delivered from illness, lameness, paralysis, were also delivered from the control and influence of the enemy. That demons were cast out with shrieks and yells, and the people were not only saved, but they were made whole. And as a consequence of his faithfulness being used by God, the Bible says there was joy in that city. Imagine that one man went to one city, and there was joy in the city. Y'all miss what I said. One man preached one gospel to a whole city, and there was joy in the whole city. Now, if one man can bring joy to a city, imagine what one church could do and the impact we could have on one city. The Bible says that the city, there was joy in the city. Here was a man now who had a ministry that was a mega ministry. There were, the Bible says, crowds of people, multitudes of people were there who were being ministered to because uh, they were being ministered not only because he declared the gospel, because he demonstrated the power of God, because the kingdom of God is not just talk. <laughs> the kingdom of God is power. And so the Bible says that there were just hordes of people there. Uh, who were being blessed and who had joy. He had a mega ministry there. You can imagine that because it was so productive and so fruitful, it was the kind of ministry that a person does not want to leave. You want to stay there so that you can continue watching God do great things in that mega ministry in that city in Samaria. But the Bible says that in the midst of the fruitfulness and productivity of that ministry, an angel of the Lord shows up and tells him to leave that city and go to a road leading from Jerusalem to Gaza, watch, in a desert place. 
Did y'all catch what I said? He was in the city doing mega ministry and the Lord told him to leave the city and go do ministry in a desert place. Y'all not getting it. He was in a place where everybody wants to do ministry and it was working. But the Bible says he sent him from this mega ministry to go to a desert place. And it's hard to do ministry in a desert place. But I want you to notice something about the commitment of Philip. That when he got the word to leave the fruitfulness of the ministry to go to a desert place, there is no evidence in the Bible that Philip says anything. The only thing the Bible reports is when the angel told him to leave, the next thing you read is, so he went. Now, if you really want to be committed to God, you got to trust him enough that when you get instructions, that you don't stay there trying to debate with God about how you ought not follow the instructions. Come on now, it'd be different if he was calling him from a desert place to a fruitful place. Everybody that wants to be in a fruitful place, but he called him from a fruitful place to a desert place, from an easier place to a harder place, from a place that was productive to a place where it's hard to produce, and he went without a word. And listen, my brothers and sisters, he knew where to go, but he didn't know why he was going. And listen, it's one thing to know that God is telling you to go, but sometimes it's hard to go when you don't know why you ought to be going. In fact, there's probably two or three in y'all in here right now. You already know what to do, but the only reason you hadn't moved is you don't know why you're supposed to do it. Can I tell you something? Go on and do it anyway. See, you got it twisted. In fact, you got it backwards. You need to flip it. You want to understand so you can obey. You got to obey so you can understand. If you want, if you want new light, you got to walk in the light you already have. And if you already know to do it, do it. And as soon as you step in that light, more light will come. And that's what he did. He got instructions to leave. And that's what he did. He left without any debate, any hesitation. Uh, the Bible says he left and went to a desert place and he just sat there in the desert place. And the Bible says, as he was going, he ran into his assignment. <laughs> and I don't know who that was for, but I felt like it was for somebody. You've been walking a while trying to figure out why you're walking. You've been going just like God says, but there's a great big question mark over your assignment. Look at your neighbor and tell him, keep walking. Yeah, because if you keep obeying, God has a habit of taking your question mark and stretching it into an exclamation point. But you got to do what he says. Look at your other neighbor in case they're sitting on the end and have nobody to talk to. Tell them, tell them, keep on walking. Yeah, you're going to run into your assignment. You're going to run into your blessing. You're going to run into the relationship, run into the opportunity. But you got to <laughs> you got to keep on walking. I don't care how deserted and desert like it looks. Anybody know God can do work in a desert place? <laughs> the Bible says he walked and ran into his assignment. The Bible tells us that a caravan or at least a chariot. We assume it's a caravan based on the person in the caravan. The Bible says it's a chariot. And in the chariot is an Ethiopian eunuch. The Bible says as soon as his chariot starts to pass by, the Holy Spirit said to him, Philip, go and walk up next to that chariot. Now here he is in the wilderness waiting on his assignment, not knowing what's happening. And all of a sudden, God tells him by way of the Holy Spirit, there it is. It's time to move now. And that means that you not only have to be uh, committed, uh, not only is it good to be uh, gifted, but you need to be alert. <laughs> you need to be spiritually sensitive because God's waiting to give you your assignment. The Bible says he saw it and he said, go walk up. And uh, he doesn't tell him anything except to go walk up it. And I guess as he was going, he'd give him more information. He runs into an Ethiopian eunuch. And before we talk about what happened between them, let's look at the background of who it is that he's going to minister to. The Bible says he's an Ethiopian eunuch. He's an Ethiopian, first of all, and he's from Ethiopia. And that Ethiopia then is not the present-day Ethiopia now. The present-day Ethiopia now would be the equivalent of Sudan. Then it was where they called Kush. That was the place of the people of color. Uh, the Greek and Roman world was infatuated and excited and 
intrigued by this area that was on the edge of civilization. In fact, Ethiopia or Africa uh, had become synonymous with dark skin. So if you ever said Ethiopia back then, it meant someone with dark skin. And so the brother in the text is an African. He's a man of color. He's an Ethiopian, and Ethiopia is in Africa, or it was in Upper Egypt near the Nile. And so here's this Ethiopian, this black man in the desert. And the Bible says he was a eunuch, and that could mean that he was either physically a eunuch or he was a eunuch by title. Physically, a eunuch simply means that he was castrated. There were times when nations would take over other nations, and oftentimes they would engage in this cruel act. They would castrate boys and some men, and they would put them initially over the king's harem. And harem was a group of women who were always at the beck and call of the king, and they would castrate him because if he was castrated, he could never uh, be a uh, cause those in the harem to be unfaithful because he was castrated. And, and after a while, that particular frayed eunuch became synonymous with position and power. So he is either physically a eunuch or he was a person. They used the title eunuch to describe someone of position and power. And he was indeed that because the Bible says he was the financier for the Candace. That is, he was the secretary treasurer for the Candace. He was the minister of finance for the Candace. And the Candace is not a name, even though it might be somebody's name in here today. I'm getting ready to tell you what your name means. Because Candace was not a name, it was a title like Pharaoh. Pharaoh is not his name. Pharaoh is his title. Candace is a title. It's the title of a dynasty of African queens, queen mothers who ruled nations, women who ruled with prosperity, women who went to war, strong women who protected their countries. And if you want to know what your name means, Candace, it means queen. That's, that's who you are. I hope you live up to your name. These were, these were sisters. These were sisters who were in charge. And the Bible says that he worked for her. He was the secretary treasurer for a sister who was the Candace uh, ruler of all of Ethiopia. So we know he's a brother. We know he's black. We, we know that he uh, has high position. He was a secretary treasurer. We know he must have had some sense of uh, self-awareness, that he had a good sense of his self-esteem because he didn't have any problem working for a sister. The Bible says he was in a chariot, which means that he had good transportation. And you know he had to have money because he was secretary treasurer for the candidate, so he probably had his own house. Ain't nobody saying nothing in here. He had his own house. And then the Bible says uh, that he was coming from church. He was coming from the tent. Y'all, the Bible says he was coming from worship. So here's a spiritual brother, a brother who was a seeker after God. It gets even better. The Bible says he was reading, <laughs> which means the brother was literate. It gets even better. He was reading the Bible. So you got a black man with a Bible. But not only was he reading the Bible, he's Ethiopian, which means he has his own mother tongue. But he's reading the Bible. It was the book of Isaiah, usually written in Hebrew, but he had the Septuagint version, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. Which means that not only was he literate, not only did he have his mother tongue, but he also read and must have spoke Greek. Which means that he was at least bilingual, if not multilingual. I wish I had help in here. So here you got a brother who's got high position, who has a sense of himself because he doesn't mind uh, working for a sister. Here's a brother who's got good transportation, good job, got a nice house, goes to church, reads his Bible, is multilingual, is literate. There's some sisters in here looking for him right now. <laughs> Am I right about it? <laughs> But the Bible says he was coming from worship. He had gone to the temple, to the Hebrew temple. He's an Ethiopian, but he had gone to the Hebrew temple, which means that he was probably either a God-fearer or a proselyte. Can I teach you a little bit? A God-fearer was someone who was among the population of people who were tired of the immorality and unethical behavior of the day. 
tired of the loose living, tired of the polytheism of multiple gods, and were drawn to the high moral and ethical standards of the Hebrew faith and to its monotheism, which was the worship of one God. And a God-fearer had not been totally converted, but it would at least go to the temple and no doubt would seek to follow the Torah or the word of God. But if they were a proselyte, then that would mean that they were a person who totally converted. And a totally convert was, means to become a Jew. And part of the process of becoming a Jew was not only committing yourself uh, to the Torah, to obedience to the law, but you also were to be circumcised and baptized. That was part of becoming a, being a Gentile and becoming a full-fledged Jew. The only problem is that if this brother was a eunuch physically, then that meant that he could not be a Jew totally because the law did not allow him to become a Jew because of his mutilation. The law said he couldn't totally be a part of the community of faith completely because of this issue he had, and that was the issue of his mutilation, not only because it said it in the book, but because for practical reasons, he could not be a part of the faith completely because in order to become a part of the faith, you had to be circumcised, and you couldn't be circumcised if you had been castrated. So there was something about him that did not allow him to be totally uh, included in the family of God. And so he could only come so far. Imagine how he must have felt. That he could only come so far. He could only come out where the Gentile worship couldn't go where the Jewish men went because there was something about him that they said disqualified him. And he couldn't go that far in the temple, which means he felt that far not only from the people in the temple, but he felt that far from God. Since they didn't include him in the temple, he did not feel probably completely uh, included by God. And so here he is. He's gone to church seeking God but he's coming back from church still seeking God which means he went to church but he left the church the same way he was when he went to church and listen my brothers and sisters if you go to church Sunday after Sunday and you leave the same way you came two things need to happen either you need to change your church Or you need to change your attitude while you're in church. Can I preach it like I feel it? And the Bible says he left I, and he felt that he couldn't be completely included if he was physically a eunuch. So he's still searching. He's still seeking. Maybe there's a loophole. Maybe there's some way God can accept me. And so the Bible says he's digging through the word. He's coming from church, but he's, he's digging in the word. He's reading in the word. And, and he's, he's seeking after God. And, and one of the things I love about God is what God says about seekers. God said, you'll find me when you seek me with your whole heart. In fact, the Bible says, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you'll be filled. And God will go to great lengths to meet you if you've never met him. I prove it to you. It's in the text. This man is in the desert looking for God. Philip was in the city serving God but God said I want to meet him so bad that I'm gonna make him come from the city to the desert so you can tell him how he can meet me even in the desert and that's why when God calls you to do something if you know it's God go on and do it because there might be a soul hanging in the balance now watch this uh Philip leaves mass evangelism in order to do personal evangelism, he leaves a group to minister to an individual. And that's there to remind us that God is not just concerned about groups in general. He's concerned about you in particular. It's in the book. I ain't making it up. Jesus tells a parable and said there's a man who has a hundred sheep. One of them is lost. What does he do? He doesn't say, well, at least I got 99 left. No, the Bible says he leaves the 90 and 9 and goes looking until he finds the sheep and brings them home. I ought to be getting more amens than that because the only reason you in the fold right now is when you was lost, he search and search and search and search until he found you and brought you back to the fold. Come on, give God 10 seconds of praise. Because he found you when you were lost. 
Hallelujah. Now watch, watch, watch. I'm running out of time. Watch. The Bible says that they meet up. Their lives intersect because God has something in mind. He says, go walk near the chariot. So it's moving slow enough for him to walk beside it. He's walking next to the chariot with the, Philip, with the Ethiopian eunuch in it, and he starts the interrogation. He, he speaks to the man. He can hear him reading Isaiah because in that day, they were in the habit of reading out loud. Uh, and sometimes it was easier to read out loud because it didn't have punctuation marks and paragraphs like we do now. So he's reading out loud. And uh, listen to what he said. He said, do you understand what you're reading? And watch what he says. He says, how can I accept somebody explain it to me? Now, that says something about the eunuch, the Ethiopian. Here was a man who was literate, educated because he's reading Greek. So we know he's an educated man. Notice what he didn't say. To Philip when he asked him, do you understand what you read? When he says, do you understand what you read? Philip didn't say, wait a minute, you don't know who you're talking to. The Ethiopian didn't say, do you know who I work for? I work for the Candace. And then, do you know where I went to school? I went to the University of Ethiopia. And I not only speak my own language, but I speak, how dare you ask me if I understand? I have the capacity to comprehend what I'm on. That's not what he said. The Bible says, he says, uh, how can I? Unless somebody explain it to me. Can I tell you why he ended up hooked up to the holy and connected to the creator and saved by Christ? It's because he admitted that he needed help. And listen, the first step to getting help is you got to act like you need some help. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I need help. Uh, and that's why it's important for you. As smart as you are, not to let your education and your pride get in the way of your enlightenment. I don't care how much we know, we never know everything. In fact, anybody who's gone through education knows that one of the things that education does, if you understand what you're going through, is it doesn't make you feel like you know everything. The more you get, the more you know you need. The more you learn, the more you know you need to learn. The more competent you get, the more incompetent you feel. Can I go deeper? That's why it's important for you to come to church and Sunday school. Uh, the Bible says about itself that it is not there for personal interpretation. In other words, don't just go off on your own. And you so smart that you can figure it out all by yourself. Look at your neighbor and tell him everybody needs help. You out there figuring out all by yourself. You can't always trust your interpretation because we all have some built-in bias in us somewhere. Can I get a witness in here? And if you're a part of the body of Christ, what God has done is God has put some gifts in the body that's designed to serve you for your personal edification. And some of the people in the Bible have the gift of teaching and preaching for the purposes of enlightening you and help you dig through the word so that you can rightly interpret it and rightly uh, divide it and apply it in your life. It is true that you have the Holy Spirit to teach you, but that's because after you hear what people have to say about the word, you need to pray about it so it can be confirmed in your spirit and in your intellect but you still need somebody to help you because you know you can't always trust what you think the holy spirit is telling you because god people lie on god all the time <laughs> i'm running out of time watch the text the text says he said do you understand he said how can i except somebody tell me and watch and the bible says he started where he was and preached to him jesus and what I'm suggesting to you is at that point in the passage, you learn a real important characteristic about a good teacher. Watch what the text says. He asked him, how can I, unless somebody explain it. And the Bible says, and Philip started where he was reading and then preached to him Jesus. The Bible doesn't say that he took him where he should have been reading. A good teacher never teaches where students ought to be. They meet students where they are. And then teach them to where they ought to be. <laughs> Can I get a witness in here? And so he started where he was. And started talking to him about Jesus. And that's what shouts me. Is he starts where he was. Where, where was he? He was in Isaiah. Where is Isaiah? It's in the Old Testament. Wait a minute. He preached to him Jesus in the Old Testament? I thought Jesus was in the New Testament. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, and Romans, and, and the letters. You can find Jesus all over the place. But he, he didn't start at that. He didn't start there because they didn't exist yet. All they had at the time was the Old Testament. But what you're learning from this text is if you take all 66 books of the Bible, old and new, all of them point to Jesus. 
I wish I had some help in here. Uh, there, there are shapes and shadows of the Messiah in the Old Testament and then there's the substance of the Messiah because he shows up in the record of the New Testament. Okay, let me break it down so y'all know what I mean. Put verse 32 up because let me just break down the text where he was reading so you can see Jesus where he was reading. I ain't going to take long. Here it is. He said this is the passage of scripture he was reading. This is the text he showed him Jesus in. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before his shearers is silent so he did not open his mouth. What is that talking about? Well, it's not talking about sheep. He says it was like a sheep. He was led to the slaughter and he didn't say a word. You know what that is? That's the prophecy about him being taken to court in preparation to be crucified. And the Bible says he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, which means he was led like a helpless lamb and he didn't say a word. He opened not his mouth. Wait a minute. It gets worse. Look at verse 33. Not only does this speak about him being in, terror, in court, but the Bible says in his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who could speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth in his humiliation. He was deprived of just what humiliation is he talking about? Well, he's not just talking about being humiliated in court. He's talking about the humiliation of uh, an innocent man being hung high and stretched wide naked in public display out on a cross and the worst thing that could happen to a person who was Jewish is to be naked and the worst way they could die was to die on the tree because the Bible says cursed is the one who dies on the tree and they did it between two thieves to add to the humiliation and it says he was deprived of justice because he died of capital punishment even though he was an innocent man watch what the text says for his, what, who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth some people think that means that he has no descendants because he died. But I think it means the opposite. Because it doesn't say for his life was taken. It says his life was taken from the earth. Who can speak of his descendants? When it says his life was taken from the earth, it doesn't simply mean that he died. He was taken from the earth, not put in the earth. Now, they did put him in the earth. But you know, on Sunday, he came up out of the earth. Then he caught a cloud and left the earth. So that text is about his ascension after his resurrection. But wait, what is this business about his descendants? Well, here it is. Because the Bible says that when Jesus got up from the grave, he was the first of many brethren or the first fruits of many brethren. In other words, Jesus came out of the grave and others came out with him. Okay, you're not getting him. They took him and put him in the ground just like you take a seed. And put it in the ground. And when you put the seed in the ground, it dies in the ground. But then it splits and comes up out of the ground. But if you put a seed in the ground, a seed does not come up. But when you put a seed in the ground, many seeds come up. And when they put Jesus in the ground, they didn't know what they were doing. Because he died, but then he got up. And when he got up, other people got up with him. I was one of the people who got up with him. Is there anybody in here who also got up with him? That's Jesus in the Old Testament. Look at your neighbor and say, there he is. <laughs> now watch, I'm almost finished. But the text says that he started there and started telling him about Jesus. Ooh, I wish I could have been there riding in the chariot so I could hear the conversation. I don't know what he said, but the conversation was comprehensive enough for him to at least tell him that one of the things that happens after you say yes to Jesus is you're baptized so you can identify with him. The reason why I know he had to tell him that is the Bible says while they were riding, they came upon a body of water. And when they saw the water, the eunuch looked at him and said to Philip, here's some water. What hinders me from being baptized? Wait a minute, I'm going to dig around there in a minute, but you need to see something. The Bible says they came upon a body of water. Y'all missing it. They were in the desert. And they didn't see it until they needed it. And what I'm trying to tell you is you might be in the desert right now, but if you just keep on going, whatever you need, he'll provide it when you need it. God, we got to get out of here. I feel like preaching, though. Now watch the text. The Bible says, he says, he said, there's some water. 
What's keeping me from being baptized? I believe that question came out of his frustration with the fact that because of his physical condition, he was not allowed full membership in the temple. So he said, I, they won't let me have full membership at that church. He said, is there anything that hinders me from being baptized right now? And, and, and he said, no, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't discriminate based on superficial stuff uh, like your color or your gender or where you live or where you, what you drive or, or nothing like that. Y'all ought to be shouting in here because the thing that keeps you away from God ain't that. In fact, if you want to be included for, by God, I got some good news for you. He already loves you. He already has included you. You just need to come and accept what he's already provided. If you believe that Jesus is the son of God, then today you can be saved. Preach, Pastor Williams. Now you said, well, you don't know my past. You don't know the issues I have. Well, I got some more good news for you. The only thing that qualifies you to be saved is you got to be a sinner first. If you're not a sinner, I ain't talking to you. But if you a sinner, you qualify to be saved. So the thing that you think keeps you from it is the thing that qualifies you for it. If you would just admit to yourself that I can't do this by myself. I need the Lord. Is there anybody in here whose testimony is that I need the Lord? So the Bible says that they went down in the water. And the book says when they came up, the Holy Ghost took Philip away and left the Ethiopian by himself. Y'all missed it. The book said they took Philip away. And the reason why I believe the Holy Ghost took Philip away is because it wasn't about Philip in the first place. And is there anybody in here who knows that once you tell somebody about Jesus, it ain't about you. You need to make sure that you get out of the way. So Jesus and them can get to know one another. You ought to be like Ed McMahon and Johnny Carson. Because when the show starts, Ed McMahon knows it ain't about him. It was about Johnny Carson. So when it was time for Johnny Carson, Ed McMahon would say, he is Johnny. And when you tell somebody about Jesus, when you finish, you ought to say, he is Jesus. The Bible says that he, he left and he left the Ethiopian, but he was not by himself because he left the Ethiopian with Jesus. And the reason why I know he was with Jesus is because the book says he was full of joy. And the only source of real joy is in Jesus. It ain't in your car. It ain't in your house. It ain't in your shrewd investment portfolio. I love my children and my wife, but they are not the source of joy because death can take them away. This joy I have, the world did not give it to me and the world can't take it away. Well, the Bible tells us that he went home and we don't hear from the Ethiopian anymore. But you can't make me believe that after he met Jesus, that he went home and didn't tell anybody. If you just let me tune in on the frequency of creativity, I can see him in my mind's eye, riding up in his chariot and pulling up in the garage. He opened the door and came in the house. His wife said, baby, how was church today? He said, uh, it was pretty good. And she said, what do you mean it was pretty good? In fact, you don't even look the same. Something about your face is shining with a glow. You smiling from ear to ear. You usually come from a long trip like that. Hundreds of miles dirty and tired. But you don't look dirty and you don't look no ways tired. He said, I said church was okay. But can I tell you what happened to me on the way from church I met a man who told me about a man who changed my life do you know him have you tried him can I tell you who he met his name is Jesus I love to call his name there's something about the name of Jesus. Can I preach this thing? There's something about his name. At the name of Jesus, demons have to flee. 
at the name of Jesus depression gives up his stronghold at the name of Jesus haters got to back off you and leave you alone there's something about his name can I call his name his name is all my trust I can feel him in my hand I can feel him in my feet I can feel him all over me somebody say yeah I'm talking about Jesus Mary's baby Jesus the rose of Sharon Jesus the lily of the valley I'm talking about Jesus Abraham's faith Micah's mercy Amos's justice Hosea's love I'm talking about Jesus my bridge over troubled water talking about Jesus my way out of nowhere talking about Jesus my money when I'm broke my fire when I'm cold I'm talking about Jesus my joy and sorrow my hope for tomorrow I'm talking about Jesus J-E-S-U-S say say yeah yeah hallelujah can't nobody do me like somebody ought to give him come on stand on your feet we hope and pray that you've been blessed by today's message and we're excited to extend an invitation for you to become a christian a devoted follower of jesus christ the bible says in john chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life For god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that through him the world might be saved if you want to be saved and have new life in jesus christ pray this prayer lord Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me of all of my sins, Lord. I turn away from my old life and turn now to you. I believe that because your son, Jesus, died on the cross for my sins, I am indeed forgiven. Now, God, I surrender my life to you and by faith, I receive Jesus Christ and accept him as Savior, Lord, and leader of my life. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit, and thank you for giving me brand new life in Jesus Christ. Lord, I am forever yours. Amen. Now that you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is important that you become a part of a Christian fellowship. If you want to become a part of Base Memorials Church, you can call the number on the screen now, and someone will be there to share with you how you can become a part of our fellowship. If you're already a follower of Jesus, but wish to become a member of Base Memorial, you too can call the number on the screen and those on the line will give you information about how you can become a member of Base Memorial. If you desire prayer, go to our website, basememorial.com, click prayer, or you can call the number on our screen. We'll be waiting for you. Well, once again, I hope that blessed your heart. I love the word of God and I know you do too. So I'm confident that God must have spoke into your life this time. It is always our pleasure, our blessing, our honor to bring you the word of God. Listen, we are able to do this because we have faithful members and even people who are not members, but are faithful friends of Base Memorial who support the ministry in many ways. One of them is through their tithe offering and sacrificial giving. If you're interested in doing that, of course, you can do that as well. And we want to try to make your capacity to do it as convenient as possible. One of the ways you can give is by um, cash app. Give it to dollar sign Base Memorial and you're offering your gift would get to uh, our church. 
Uh, if you don't want to use that way, you can always go to the website, go to basememorial.com and uh, click on the giving tab, follow the brief instructions, and it will get where it's supposed to go. If those two ways don't work, you can always text to give. And it's right there on your screen. Follow the instructions and we'll get what you want uh, to support this ministry. And if none of those work and you just want to drop it by, well, then you can do that too. Many people do while you're out and about. Just drop it by and we'll make sure it gets where it's supposed to go. If none of those ways work, well, just mail it in and mail it to Bates Memorial 620, that's 620 East Lampton Street, Louisville, Kentucky 40203, and we will make sure it gets where it's supposed to go. What's up, Bates Memorial family and friends? Listen, this is the year that we're serving with a made-up mind, and we've got a lot that you can get involved in. Check this out. Hi, Bates family. My name is Nina Reed, also known as The Reed Bunch on all my social media platforms. Today, I have some super exciting news to share with you guys. Starting January 1st, we are going to be Daniel fasting for 21 days. And this year, we have videos about how to Daniel fast, the do's and don'ts, shopping tips and tricks, and so much more. For more information about the Daniel fast, tune in to BatesMemorial.com. Hello, Bates family and friends. This is Minister Tony Phelps, staff accountant here at Bates Memorial. And let me start by telling you that I sure do miss seeing you guys, but I'm looking forward, as I'm sure you are, to the day that Pastor Williams gives us the word that we can come together again for in-person worship. And oh, what a day that's going to be. The main reason I'm here is to remind you that this will soon be time for us to distribute 2020 giving statements. Given the current pandemic and the need for us to continue to socially distance, we want to make sure that we have all the information we need to get your giving statements to you. Email is the most efficient way to deliver them to you. But if you prefer delivery by U.S. mail, we can do that, too. That means we need to make sure that we have your most current contact information in our system. So we are asking that you go to our website at www.batesmemorial.com. Click on the membership tab, enter your email and password, and it will take you directly to your personal page. Or you can create your personal account if you have been signing in as a guest to give or you've been using Cash App. Then you go to the home and select profile and the drop down menu. And from there, you can update your address and telephone number, and you can enter your preferred email address where we will send your 2020 giving statements. Now, if you need a little assistance, don't hesitate to call at 502-636-0523, extension 206, and we will be more than happy to walk you through the process. Thank you all so much for your faithful giving to this ministry of changed people changing the world. God bless you. Hello, Bates Memorial family. As we prepare to end this year and to begin the new year with our 21-day Daniel Fast, we want to remind you to also accompany that with 21 acts of kindness. Whether that's taking out someone's trash, providing them with a bag of groceries, or giving them a gas card, we encourage you to get out there and show someone how much you care. Hey family, this is Minister John here with Christian Education. Um, we have some big news to announce. First and foremost, happy new year. We know everything that has happened in 2020 and it took us unawares, but there is an important thing that we want to make sure that we continue to do, and that is recognize what our congregation, every individual in our church has done throughout the year. So if you um, completed any of the new member classes, Super Saturday, Master Lives 1, 2, 3, or 4, um, teachers training, we want to recognize you and congratulate you. And so what Christian Education is doing is having our first ever virtual graduation. It's January the 31st. Uh, get with your teachers. Email me at jrandolph at basememorial.com to get all of the details. We don't want to miss you, and we want to congratulate you for everything that you have done, even in 2020. Look, we're still called to be faithful. Nothing's going to stop us from doing kingdom work. I hope that you're uh, still being safe. Be blessed. 
That's what's going on here at Bates Memorial, and we want you to get involved. Again, God bless you. We love bringing you the Word of God through this virtual uh, way, but we know that the uh, mechanism is virtual, but the Word is real. Let's pray together and receive the blessing from the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. It is a lamp into our feet, a light into our pathway. We promise as best we can by your grace to hide your word in our heart, like David says, so that we might not sin against you. Thank you, God, for keeping your word through the centuries so that we might have a manual to live in a way that blesses others and pleases you. Thank you, God, finally, for your son, without whom we would not know eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Receive this benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee, the Lord. Lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And give thee peace and give thee peace. For Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. God bless you. I'll see you next time.